Why did author John Peyton Bowden decide to set his novel in Sarajevo? <laughs> Today on All About Canadian Books, we are going to find out, but before we speak with John, please subscribe to my channel. If you love books, I interview authors the second and fourth week of every month on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Hi, my name is Crystal Fletcher. Welcome to All About Canadian Books. Today's guest is author John Peyton Bowden. And here is his debut novel, Magenta. And here is what it is about. Magenta is a harrowing journey into war-torn Sarajevo and into the blackest reaches of the human condition. The novel follows journalist Silva as she and her team make their way deep into a city under siege to recover the body of theory an award-winning filmmaker. To find out if Silva survives the city, you have to read Magenta. It's published by Crow's Nest Books. Welcome, John Peyton Bowden, to All well, About Canadian you. Books. No, it's, I'm, pl I'm pleased to be here. I'm pleased to have you. And how are you today? Uh, today, everything is A-OK. -okay. I love it. I love it. So, John, we unfortunately, we live in a world full of conflict. You have chosen to set your novel in Sarajevo. Why have you, why Sarajevo? <laughs> there I go stumbling over my words. Why, why Sarajevo? Why Sarajevo? Yes. Uh, I didn't really have a choice uh, for two reasons. The first is that uh, this, the, the nugget, the, just the, the germination of this story happened in a dream. Uh, and it had happened, um, and it's something like this has never happened before, it never happened since. I had the first half of the dream on one night. I thought, wow, isn't that amazing? So I, I jotted down some notes, yeah. went to work, came home, did my, didn't even think about it again. The next night, I had the second half of the dream. So now from that, I think very few things survived. There are a couple of scenes that did um, but uh, most of it went by the wayside because it was a dream, right? A lot of nonsense. Yeah. Uh, but I think this is where, as a writer, you have to be in tune with uh, who you are, what you're feeling, and try to try to um, investigate those things and, and reach in and find out what it's about. Because I remember at the time, I was in a job and I was feeling trapped by the job. Yeah. Um, and the Civil War in the Balkans was on the front page of the newspaper every day. Yeah. And somehow or other, my brain was was trying to reconcile these things. And I was actually the one taken hostage in the dream. Uh, oh needless to say, God. that wasn't going to work. Um, not for this story, it wasn't going to work. Um, yeah. And so I, I, I thought about other places where something like this might happen. But it, the message isn't doesn't resonate quite as well if it were the American Civil War instead of the Balkan Civil War or the Spanish mm -hmm. Civil War. Uh, there's an issue about technology and about movement and the speed of movement and the vehicles. And um, it was interesting to write it, too, because there's no cell phones, there's no ubiquitous Internet. Yeah. Uh, and I had to be very careful about how I had people communicate and talk so this was sort of before we stopped talking to each other yeah. right yeah. and the, the other thing about this was that it was a subnational army surrounding one of its own cities um and the third component uh, on this was um it uh it was it was a civil war that was particularly brutal but it was people who looked like other people you know, a lot of the hatred we see now is because we see difference in others, right? We visually see it, their skin color, their hairstyles, their, their attitudes when they move about the city. But here, these people look the same, had the same names, um, they intermarried with each other, but based on ethnicity, um, and I don't know how they decided who was what. Um, this was about the only place uh, I could I could set it. And it's a valley town, so it was rimmed by mountains, which is where they took up the post. Uh, so I didn't fight it for long because it made perfect sense that it should be there. And, uh, and I think there are lessons to be learned from Sarajevo in particular. Absolutely. But it's important to note um, that 
despite the fact that Sarajevo is mentioned, there are no mentions of Yugoslavia or mm -hmm. Serbia or Bosnia or Croatia. I didn't want to be that specific, but Sarajevo was a thing. It was an Olympic city as well. And that, that yeah. mattered, right? Because we had all come together in this, this human celebration of brotherhood. Yes. And within what? Within eight years, they had fallen into, a, it, it turned into a hellhole. So yeah, yeah that's lucky, lucky for us that you wrote it all down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and actually out of curiosity too so you said it came to you in a dream which character came to you first was it silva or theory or um i uh who was it drago probably yeah it would have been drago okay. uh, because as i said in my dream i was the one taken hostage but yes. I, I have some trouble I, I had trouble with that a because I couldn't identify that closely with the character. And I don't think male characters are really always as interesting as females because men, it's fight or flight. That's when right. women are much more nuanced and much more sophisticated, mm -hmm. they're, the choices they have to make, the negotiating and bargaining they have to do in a scenario like that, um, th there were just so many more possibilities for Silva. Uh, than you know, having that role taken up by a man. Uh, but Drago, because it was this, this oppressive uh, uh, hobnail boot on your neck, yeah. um, was, was, wasn't so much I saw the character in my dream, I could feel that sort of oppression. Yeah. Uh, and so, that's, so Drago was a character that was fairly clear from the beginning. Yeah, yeah. And on that note, like um, not only that character, but if, because you're dealing with a war and how violent you you take the reader to some fairly dark and traumatic places and you know as I was reading I kept thinking you know for you as the writer like how did you decompress after spending all of that time in such a dark place uh <laughs> 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 the obvious, uh, which I, um, uh, a lot of it is just getting on with the business of doing the job, right? The job is to write the story. And what mm -hmm. I wanted to do is I wanted you to say as a reader, that's too much. I don't need to see that. Well, guess what? You do have to see it. Yes. And so my job was to, to take you into the, the worst recesses of, of, uh, of human depravity. Uh, and, you know, there was there was two ways to do this. The prevailing question on most days is, you know, what is the worst thing that can happen to Silva? Uh, mm -hmm. I understood that that was, um, you know, as, uh, ran the risk of being misogynistic. Uh, so how can she maintain her sense of self uh, mm -hmm. and uh, her sense of self-worth uh, despite all the things that are going on around her? Mm -hmm. And there were some situations where I've never been uh, held hostage with somebody with a gun in my face, mm -hmm. uh, but you really have to let all the things that you think you know go by the wayside and, and really set yourself there. What would, could that feel like? And you have to be open to the fact that, and this is you know, something I think I learned about myself, is... Um, I don't know how I would react. You think you're going to be strong yes. and, uh, and heroic. Um, yeah. But in some ways, I, I started to identify a little bit more with Stefan as the story went along, that you're hopeless. Yes. Uh, yes. And in the face of somebody who is prepared to terminate your existence, uh, do you really have the courage to stand up to that person? Do, you know, yeah. Is there anything in your life that can, prove, uh, you know, that can help you get through this situation? Mm -hmm. And a lot of it for, for Silva, a lot of it's negotiation, a lot of it is uh, is um, is uh, is conversation, uh, uh, and she I think gets ahead of of many. So, like she can see these things coming where Stefan can't, and I think that's yeah. why he is overwhelmed more often than not. Uh, but the decompressing part was I think a taking a deep breath. You, you I, one of the scenes in particular was difficult. Yes, uh, and it took me the better part of uh, a couple of days to get it done. Yes, uh, to be. Um, gruesome and sensitive at the same time yeah um and there were originally uh there were two scenes like that and jane had the, the good sense to say look you don't need both you can make your point with one yeah uh, and uh, and you know i to sit back to take a deep breath um a stiff drink and then get back on get back <laughs> on with the business because there's there's more to come 
Yeah. And, you know, as a reader, there were parts where I was going through and I was like, oh, God, but because we are so sheltered in Canada, like this is just so foreign to us. So, I mean, you certainly when I finish the book, you have a much better idea of what it would be like to be in a war torn country, which is absolutely unbelievable. And John, you know, one of the things I kept thinking of as well when I was reading your novel was, you know, you see these tragic circumstances which bring out the best in people, but also the worst in people. Um, do you think that people are naturally evil or can a situation cause someone to become corrupted, shall we say? Yeah, I think uh, people much smarter than I am have tried to tackle that question and probably come up with as many blanks as I have. Yeah. Um, my own personal theory would be that I think the electrochemical impulses going on in your head yeah. when you're in the immediacy of a dangerous situation will um, somehow, and I think surprise people what they're, they're prepared to do. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't know that people are innately evil. I think that people can be, uh, uh, they can learn, uh, they can be uh, oppressed or beaten or, or tortured or put in a position where um, their, their humanity is lost. Mm -hmm. And I think we mm -hmm. see some of that towards the end because of some of the choices that Silva makes as the, as we get towards the end of the story. Uh, and, uh, but you know, whether people are innately evil, I don't know. Yeah. I, it's hard to believe with some of the, the things that we see out there in the wider world. I mean, it's ubiquitous, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. You know, we don't see it so much here. And one of the points in the, in the book is that when the cameras stop rolling, when the stories aren't being told, we in places like Canada and the U.S. and, yeah. and Western Europe, forget about all of this, right? Yeah. And, and that's why, for me, it was important that you see what it is you've forgotten yeah. uh, and, and face it now and have a look at this. Because if you don't, um, I'm aware of two books that have been published talking about the likelihood of civil war in the United States. Well, it's going to look a lot like Magenta. You know, it's going to be that insidious, uh, and uh, it's not going to be some fancy rules-based Geneva Convention conflict. Yeah, it will yeah. be, it'll be personal, uh, it'll be urban, it will be, um, it'll be horrific if something like that happens, and it'll happen here and there, and yeah. you know, there'll be no massed armies. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, we're in a, a dangerous place, and we have to be very, very careful. I think the, the steps that we take. Yes. From now on. yes. And another thing, John, that I kept thinking about your novel, which I really appreciated as I was going through as a reader, you know, all of these war correspondents who who go abroad and, and bring us, I mean, these very important stories. I can't imagine what it's like for them with post-traumatic stress syndrome, the adrenaline. Um, do you think it's possible for them to ever return to like civilian life uh i i think yes i think yes. because uh well they have um a uh a measure of courage that i don't have the fact that there are guns going off uh in a place like that uh <laughs> No, I got no interest in a place like that. It doesn't matter what the story is. And, and maybe that's why the novel form 30 years later is, is my yeah. preferred way of, of uh, sharing uh, my ideas on that. But I have a neighbor, his name is Mike Grippo. He's a lovely, lovely man, very thoughtful, very supportive, uh, has a lovely family. Uh, and he was a CBC cameraman uh, mm -hmm. in Sarajevo. And so, you know, I don't think Mike had any trouble uh, reintegrating. He introduced me to a woman named Corinne Dufka. Yeah. who um, uh, she's brilliant. She, she was actually the winner of a MacArthur Genius Grant uh, and she's generous to a fault. She read the manuscript and gave me some really good ideas in the yeah. manuscript. She gave me a, a dust jacket blurb for the book. Um, she's a mm -hmm. wonderful, wonderful woman and, uh, and smart as they come. Uh, so she's been able to reintegrate into uh, civilian life. But uh, mm -hmm. the Globe and Mail did a symposium uh, um, called Shooting War, and it's based on the work of a professor at the University of Toronto named Anthony Feinstein. And I didn't know about Anthony Feinstein until after I'd finished Magenta. But then I found out about him and looked at his book, and he follows um, journalists 
uh, mm -hmm. who work on the front lines. And as a psychologist, I think he's a psychologist, um, his job is to understand the psychology of what happens to journalists who serve on in, in like a combat zone. Yeah. Uh, so it's, an, it's a really, really interesting book. He does 18 profiles and Corinne is one of them. Um, there are a few other really interesting stories. They don't all take place in Sarajevo, uh, but when the Globe and Mail did their symposium, they did uh, one of them, uh, the, the meetings down at the TIFF light box, and they would have a, they had a panel uh, of journalists, and I can't say that they all came out uh, scar-free. Um, yeah, yeah. there, there was at least one gentleman, and you just it, it's so sad to see I mean completely broken psychologically yeah. intellectually um, uh, and clearly that was I think reflected you know in his physical conditioning as well just yeah. you know he was slovenly and slurred his words and uh, oh, he was really really suffering and it was uh, and I'm sure that had to do with you know being at the pointed end of the stick in a yeah. in a very very traumatic situation and you know it's no fault of his um the courage it takes for for anyone to step up and <laughs> walk into that I just no it's uh, I think the the prudent course of action is to stay here where it's nice and safe yeah <laughs> It, it's such an important job, such an important job to it keep. It really is. And you, yeah. and you worry about media, uh, you know, with, with, you know, the internet, it's, 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 it's painless. It's costless yeah. to actually put your opinion on, uh, on the internet anymore. And yet these are news outlets that are, that are taking professional, um, mm. uh, intelligent folks asking them to step in front of the barrel of a gun or in a city that's being bombarded uh, yeah. to tell us what it's really like I, I hope that what I've done is to tell you what it was really like but you know I wasn't there and admit that yeah. freely uh, but a lot of the information that I got I got from those people who were who were on the front lines it's also interesting to note that the Balkan Civil War is probably one of the first places where the female contingent of reporters was comparable to the male contingent of reporters. People oh. like Erin Dufka, and there's a woman who writes, she's at Yale University now, um, um, Janine DiGiovanni. Um, and so there were women reporting just as, you know, prior to that. I, I don't even know if you had women correspondents in the Second World War uh, yeah. or even Vietnam. I'm sure there yeah. were, uh, yeah. but uh, in, in the Balkans, it was a much more equitable uh, representation. Okay. Would you say that would be probably one of your biggest surprises when you're researching about the women journalists or did you, what would be the biggest surprise? Well, the biggest surprise actually was, was personal. Uh, so mm -hmm. the way I wrote this, I wrote based on what I thought I knew uh, mm -hmm. so that I could get the narrative right. Yeah. And it's because I wanted the narrative to flow, to be good, to be solid. And then I went back and, and fact checked everything that I had written. Yes. And so in going back, uh, I realized that the, there's, I, I call it the Hotel Europa. Yes. Uh, when I went back to double check on things, there is actually a hotel in that very spot um, called Europe, Hotel Europe or something like that. And oh. it's almost exactly where I put that hotel. The same oh. thing, the monastery scene I, where the monastery is in my head where I'd mapped it out this route they were taking there is a monastery in that exact spot and I, I, wow. I didn't know that. yeah and when that happens it's just wow yeah you know, this yeah. is magic right this is um yeah. and you know you've been doing something that is good and meaningful and something that's important uh because those moments when they happen are you know they're electric yeah and they are like, yeah. you got it right you got it yeah. right yep yeah. yeah. Oh, that, that, that is very cool. Very cool. Um, last question, John, um, for viewers, if you missed our, um, the introduction interview, which was on Tuesday, John does answer what he's working on next, but I'm going to ask him again, what's next? <laughs> what's next? Well, uh, I have, um, uh, two books finished that are looking for a home. Um, one is about not community, like in Magenta, communities falling apart. This yes. is about communities coming together. Nice. Uh, the the other one is the is the centerpiece on a whole universe of other stories. Um, mm -hmm. The book is called Celestial, and it follows a um, 
a woman, a centenarian who lives 100 years through each of the most important social movements uh, in, in North America. She moves with the story, physically moves with the story. So for instance, she'll spend uh, um, her childhood in uh, depression or um, prohibition era New Orleans. Uh, she spends the depression in Key West. She's in Hollywood during the golden age of television, you know, and so, and there are characters in that story that show up in other stories. Uh, Nadia in Magenta, um, who shows up in the prologue and the epilogue, becomes a character in, in the latter part of Celestial, yeah. and she becomes a character in the first part of the book I'm writing right now, which is called Ascension. And Ascension is a forward look, well, it's actually a backward look at the, f the future history of, of Toronto, essentially. Okay. And so I, I, what I'm doing is writing a history of the city from the perspective 150, 200 years out. Somebody at that point looking back uh, through, the, through the filter of, uh, of four key people in a, uh, uh, in, a, in a family. And so there are characters there that, that appear in, in other stories. Okay, well, I really like Nadia, so I look forward to learning okay. a little more about her. John, thank you very much for being a guest on All About Canadian Books. I really enjoyed getting the story behind your book, and I'll just hold it up again, Magenta. And uh, viewers, I will put links down below in the description box so you can purchase a copy of Magenta. I'll also put a link to um, John's website so you can learn more about him. That's thank great. you, John. Thank you very much for having me. And I should thank the guys at Crow's Nest Books. They have been yeah. uh, very helpful. Uh, and uh, it's not easy to get something like this done in between the covers and out the door. Uh, and they've been fabulous. So I just want to thank them. Oh, great. And thank you, Crow's Nest. We'll all thank them too, because yeah. I enjoyed your book. <laughs> yeah. Viewers, thank you for watching and be sure to come back in a couple weeks. Bye. Thanks for having me. Pleasure.